Thank you, George. It's um, a real pleasure to be here. Um, I was trying to remember, I think it was four years ago, I also yeah. spoke at this, or maybe five. I, I just, I didn't have time to look it up, but uh, it, it's just um, really great to be back here. And I, I want to start uh, just by acknowledging all the, the, the hard work and effort that, that George goes to. I don't know of anybody on the planet that is evangelizing value investing and teaching value investing more than, than George. And um, you're to be congratulated for that. And I also, I, I just want to congratulate all of you on the front end. I mean, it's July, it's summertime, you just spent a week here uh, trying to get better and to learn, and I think that's really cool. You paid money to come here. I'm not saying it wasn't a good deal, <laughs> but you paid money to come here. So um, congratulations to all of you. So, and Jeff, uh, you got people from India, from China? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I was just gonna, how many different countries are represented here? Um, so Canada, obviously, we've got a few. Canada, U.S. Uh, uh, U.S. Switzerland, uh, India, Australia, yeah. uh, Singapore, UK, yeah. Indonesia. Yeah. Indonesia. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Chile, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. 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 Save the best for last, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I just think that's really really cool and I think um, you know I hope that um, you will challenge me a bit as I go through my presentation so I thought um, it might be interesting to go in a bit of a different direction and so you've spent the last week learning how to value companies and you know the art of valuation but Primarily with the idea that you'll buy something and you'll hold it as an investment for a long period of time. Um, and, and that is you know, certainly what we do at our firm as well, and, and certainly the majority of our assets are invested in that way. But I thought you might be interested in an underappreciated Ben Graham Warren Buffett investment technique. So what is it? Um, event-driven investing, and I'm going to explain that um, in, in a little bit more detail in a minute. But this was written, Ben Graham wrote about these techniques and security analysis. Um, Buffett's written extensively about them over the years. He hasn't done so much event-driven investing in the last decade just because of size, Although, interestingly enough, he had a large position in Monsanto over the last year, which you may recall it was part of a, a takeover offer from, from uh, Bayer, the German company. So even although less than he once did, and it's less of a mainstay of his investment techniques today, just because of the size of Berkshire Hathaway, even in the most recent year, he's still doing it. So, I want to start with a little bit of, you hear these terms thrown about, you know, event-driven, arbitrage, workouts, risk arbitrage, and even throughout his history, Buffett talked about them in different ways, and he would, or used different labels, but he was really talking about the same thing. So I just want to start and say I may slip and interchange these terms uh, today as I'm talking about this subject as well, they're all the same thing, but we're going to try and stick to the phrase event-driven investment. So what am I talking about? What is it? It's the pursuit of profits from announced corporate events. So it's any mergers, recapitalizations, spin-offs, liquidations, reorganizations, bankruptcies, self-tenders, and it can all lead to an event-driven opportunity to invest. And the key to evaluating everyone is, is a series of four questions, and I'm gonna lay them out for you in more detail in a minute, but it's just, you know, probability of the event occurring, how long is our money gonna be tied up, what's the upside of, or what, what 
still better could happen to us and what happens if something goes wrong. So the four questions. Why we like this, and I think why Buffett liked it and Ben Graham liked it, is you, you expect to profit regardless of the behavior of the stock market. It, in most circumstances, I'm not going to say it's 100% um, uncorrelated to market activity, but usually whether a deal happens or doesn't happen has nothing to do with whether the stock market's up or down a thousand points. So I, I'm going to apologize in advance. The next five or so slides that I take you through are not good PowerPoint slides. And uh, you know I've had the uh, privilege for a number of years of judging the, uh, the, the Ben Graham stock picking competition. And I'm always telling the participants that you know you have crisp PowerPoint slides. Don't try to get everything on them. The next five, I must admit, are not very crisp, and, but, but there's a lot of content that I, I just want to get out there, and, and I'm borrowing from Buffett's writings over the next four or five slides. So let's talk about it. Um, it's referring to event-driven investing, of course. These are securities whose financial results depend on corporate action rather than supply and demand factors created by buyers and sellers of securities. In other words, they are securities with a timetable, the four questions here, where we can predict within reasonable error limits when we will get how much and what might upset the apple cart. Corporate events such as mergers, liquidations, reorganizations, spin-offs, etc. lead to workouts. Notice he's using the phrase workouts in 1962. This is from the Buffett Partnership letter in 1962. So let's just continue to drill down here a bit over the next few slides. So the risk pertains not primarily to the general market behavior. We like that, that it's insulated from markets, although that is sometimes tied into a degree, and that's important to state that. But instead, uh, it, it's related, or the risk is related to something upsetting the apple cart so that the expected development does not materialize. Such killjoys could include antitrust or other negative government actions, stockholder disapproval, withholding of tax rulings, etc. And, and the gross profits in workouts tend to be quite small. But, or however, the predictability uh, coupled with a short holding period produces quite decent annual rates of return. And again, this notion of insulation from markets, this category produces more steady absolute profits from year to year than generals do, and that was Buffett's phrase for his long-term investments. Um, in years of market decline, it piles up a big edge for us. Uh, during bull markets, it's a drag on performance. Um, so I'm just trying to plant the seeds here, and again, we're halfway through on uh, uh, bad PowerPoint slides, but I just think it's important to get all this content out. Um, this is from the Berkshire Hathaway 1988 letter to shareholders. In past reports, we have told you that our insurance subsidiaries sometimes engage in arbitrage. Notice he's changed from workouts to arbitrage now. Uh, in arbitrage as an alternative to holding short-term cash equivalents. We prefer, of course, to make major long-term commitments. And that I, I want to be clear on that. At our firm, you know, we would love to be 100% invested in a concentrated portfolio of really great companies that we can just put away and own for a long, long period of time. But we often have more cash than good ideas. At such times, arbitrage sometimes promises much greater returns than treasury bills and equally important, cools any temptation we may have to relax our standards for long-term investments. And I think those words say a lot. You know, and at our firm, we've been anywhere from zero and invested in event-driven investments and zero many, many times. Um, I think the highest we got was about 45% when we just weren't finding anything um, at, at all to do. So a couple more, I think. Um, since World War I, the definition of arbitrage or risk arbitrage, as it is now sometimes called, so we've introduced the, another label here, um, 
has expanded to include the pursuit of profits from announced corporate events such as the sale of the company, merger, recap, reorg, liquidation, self-tender, etc. Same definition I used basically earlier. In most cases, the arbitrager expects to profit regardless of the behavior of the stock market. The major risk he usually faces is that the announced event won't happen. Um, he is a gender neutral uh, phrase in this context. Um, so this is what Buffett said about those four questions that I was saying, you know, to, so to evaluate arbitrage situations, you must answer four questions. How likely is it that the promised event will indeed occur? Takeover of company A. How long will your money be tied up? Obviously, if you're making a 5% return in three months, that's 20% annualized, give or take. But if you're making 5% in two years, it's only a 2.5% give or take annualized rate of return. So that really drives a lot of the, 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 the math here. And so then the upside question, what chances are that something still better will transpire? The obvious one there is a competing takeover bid. And then the downside question, what will happen if the event does not take place? And there is a myriad of things. He just talks about antitrust and financing glitches. You know, most deals require shareholder approval. Maybe there's tax rulings that are required. So we're going we're gonna to talk to some of those. So that's planting the seeds for you in terms of what is this activity. So now I'd like to take you through two case studies. And when you're talking about event-driven investing, what I like to do is I want to show you one that was done fairly recently, but it's complete. And so I'll show you the exact rate of return that we got on that. But then I also am going to take you through a second case study, one that's in progress. And if it works out as I think it does, maybe George will let me come back. If uh, it doesn't work out, uh, well, I won't be back. And uh, I will... I will not admit that we ever did it. So, uh, um, so let me walk you through the first one, a completed deal that is a, a, about a year old. It closed, about, uh, closed in June of 2017. But Johnson & Johnson was buying a Swiss pharmaceutical company or made an offer to buy a Swiss pharmaceutical company, Actelium. So let's talk it through. What were the basic details? Well, the deal got announced on January 26th of, of last year, of 2017. The terms or the consideration, you were going to get 280 US dollars per share in cash, and then you were gonna get one share in a new R&D company for every share of Actelian that you owned, and that company was to be called Idorcia. And we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Not an uncommon provision. The deal had uh, that you know two thirds of the shareholders had to approve it, or, or Johnson and Johnson didn't have any obligation to go ahead. There was a variety of competition clearances, and this is very typical. There's actually more than this, but these were the main ones that you want to think through. So the US, the EC, Japan, Russia, Israel, and Turkey. And I'm not sure why Turkey, to be honest with you, but it, it seemed to be um, a, a critical, because they, they talked about it specifically. Like in these deal documents, usually what happens is the main ones that um, are the key ones get disclosed and then there's usually a, a few other minor ones and oftentimes the documents are written in such a way that if we get these key ones we will proceed and we'll deal with the other ones as, as circumstances warrant. In a lot of these transactions you'll have what's called a material adverse condition or a material adverse event. So that's just merely saying Johnson & Johnson is saying, okay, it's our intention to go ahead, but if something bad happens over the course of the deal that constitutes a material adverse event, we can walk from this transaction. And in this particular case, it got defined as 
an event that led to a drop in earnings before interest and tax at a 15% or something that would impact 10% of sales. So that was how they defined the material adverse event. And they announced at the time they expected to close it in late 2017. I just put our estimate when we were doing the, the work was that probably they could get it done by June 15. Um, so those are the details. So what are some of the things that we're thinking about as we're trying to assess whether we want to do this and take a position? First one was there was no financing condition. So Johnson Johnson, they had the money in a bank account in Switzerland that could close the transaction. And so when you get that, just lowers the risk enormously. You know, you don't have to worry about um, an investment banker raising the money and some event happens, you know, markets crater, and now they can't raise the money. Johnson & Johnson had the money. So that's a big one. Um, this was a premium price. And I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly what the premium was, but I think it was double to where it was trading. Or, or give or take, might have been 80%. And they had, they had a lockup agreement with the C CEO, fellow by the name of uh, J.P. Clozel. And this is important. So basically, well, actually, I'll, I'll hold on that just for a moment. Um, and this had been well shopped. It was up for sale for a long time. It was rumored that Santa Fe was going to, or Santa Fe Aventus was going to buy it before Johnson & Johnson stepped forward. So it was well known, and, and there was a very rigorous process to sell this company. So remember, we're going to get $280 US, and then we're going to get this stub in a company called Idorcia. So what were some of the things that we were thinking about as just um, thumbnails, if you will? Certainly you don't have numbers to do the work that you were doing on Stella Jones, you know, so you just have some thumbnails. And I'm the first person to admit I have no ability to evaluate some startup uh, pharmaceutical uh, company that has some patents and a few things in it. But I, I just want to spend a moment, it kind of related to the second bullet point in this one. Um, J.P. Clozel was, uh, created enormous wealth for many people in Switzerland. He had this startup that over 20 years he took to this incredible multi-billion dollar valuation. He was still a very large shareholder. But his motivation in all of this was he was tired of running a big company and all the sales effort and all the regulatory effort. He was a scientist. He wanted to be in the labs working on developing new compounds and new drugs. So he was driving this notion that, okay, Johnson & Johnson, for $280, you get all the existing drugs and all that, and you get all the infrastructure. But what I want you to do is put our R&D structure into this new company and any of the new things that we're working on that haven't yet reached any commercialization. That's what we want in Adorcia. And then, of course, we need to have some cash there as well so that we can continue with our R&D slate. So what uh, what uh, what J and J? Um, so there's this early stage pipeline. How do you value it? I don't have a clue. Um, but we do have two data points that gave us at least a bit of an idea as to what a floor might be. So J and J agreed that they would put money in to provide cash at a Dorsey at close. So they were going to invest about 235 million um, Swiss francs for 16% interest. So just the math worked out approximately, that's 1150 a share. So I'm not saying that's what it's worth, I'm not saying that's intrinsic value, but I'm saying that's what, in an arm's length transaction, Johnson & Johnson was prepared to buy 16% of this at a valuation that worked out to 1150 a share. At closing, there was going to be $8 Swiss francs a share in cash. 
okay, I get it. That's going to burn down over time because they're going to spend that money. But it, it was just at least a reference. I'm saying, all right, day one, there's $8 in cash and this drug pipeline. So I'm sort of comfortable in saying, all right, maybe $8 is a floor on, the, on valuing the stuff. Throughout this process, there will, uh, Actelian had a drug called Uptravi. So right in the middle of this, as you're going through uh, uh, the deal process, the French regulators basically, they didn't stop the drug or pull the drug, but they refused to allow physicians in France to uh, put new patients on Uptravi um, because they had some data that they were concerned about. So that, of course, got the marketplace all upset that would that trigger a material adverse event? And you know, something you should certainly think about. And remember in the earlier slide, I said it was 15% of EBIT or 10% of sales. So the way we thought about it was that it would have to be a recall worldwide of Optravi. Most of the sales were in the United States for you to get close to that material adverse event. And at that time, I think, you know, Uptravi sales were about 9%, but it was growing quite dramatically. So you, if, if this ballooned and, you know, all the other uh, health authorities like, okay, France, what have you got? What are you seeing on the data that would lead you to conclude we better take a pause here? That could be a problem. We just thought it was unlikely that over a four or five month period that the deal was in progress, that all the regulatory bodies and health authorities would be able to react that quickly. And then what gave us further assurance is Johnson Johnson actually came out with a press release and said, look, before we entered the transaction, we knew this was coming. We knew there was a risk of this. We had been in touch with the French regulators. And so we were not surprised that that they brought this forward. And then I might also add, this was not a full stop recall. You can't sell the drug in France. Anybody that was on it was still allowed to continue on the medication. It was just doctors were not allowed to prescribe new patients in France. So again, maybe I'm not looking at that in the right way, but I just sort of said, all right, I don't, if, if they had evidence that this is killing people massively, it'd be a full recall. They're probably just taking a pause and trying to make sure they understand um, the data. So those are the things that we're thinking about as we're trying to assess risk. So let me take you through a timeline. You know, deal was announced January 26th. We purchased our first shares on the 30th of January. We purchased again on February 1st. Uh, the middle of February, the prospectus, the offering document to the deal came out. Those are great because it gives you all sorts of details about the background of the transaction and you can kind of understand a, a little bit better about where the risks are and where the risks lie. So when those come out, you want to be all over them and reading them and understanding what's in there. Uh, we purchased more shares in uh, March. Um, then at the end of March, the main tender off. So in Switzerland, you have a primary tender period and a secondary tender period. Um, so the first period ended on the 30th. Um, they announced on the 31st that the tender offer was declared successful. And what I mean by that, 60, remember we said two thirds had to tender. So they had over two thirds tender on the initial um, uh, tender period, so they declared the merger successful from that perspective. Same date you got uh, um, US, Japan, and Israel regulatory approvals in, so again, you're knocking off these milestones, and as you knock off all these milestones, the risk is in theory going down, because there's less things that can go wrong. So then, in early April, they had the general meeting. They had to have a meeting 
because to spin off Idorcia, you had to get shareholder approval. So you, this was kind of, uh, in that sense, a unique deal. You had a tender piece going on. OK, yeah, I want to be involved in this deal. But then you had to approve the spin off of Idorcia as a shareholder. So that was successful um, on April 5th. And then you had this secondary tender period, um, which ended April 21st. And on the 19th of June, so we were budgeting the 15th, if you'll remember, on the 19th of June, you actually had the closing and the Idorcia listing, and we sold our Idorcia shares the very next day. So let me take you through the math. What did that look like in terms of returns? So we received $280. We sold our Idorcia at an equivalent price of $14.92 US. It was something a little less than that in Swiss francs. And uh, sorry, I don't have the exact, but it would have been like $13 or something. Um, we paid $274 all in over those three dates that we purchased. So we locked in a gross profit of $20.66 $20 or 7.5%. We had a weighted average holding period of 113 days, so it generated an annualized rate of return of 24.32%. Um, so that's an example. That is exactly the return we earned um, in US dollars. Um, so now I'm going to take you through one that's on the comp. Yes? Do you, do you factor in tax because it's like a short-term gain and we have a different tax rate? within the year versus like a long time So uh, in Canada, um, you're taxed at income rates on those. Um, in the US, of course, it would depend short term, long term. All those are very real considerations. And I'm actually going to speak to that as a bit of a negative. But remember the context that I laid out for you in the Buffett uh, uh, quotations that, you know, better than treasury bills, uh, you, you're not tempted then to do something inferior on the long term side because you've got this ability to put money to work. So I'm not trying to um, uh, slide over that tax point because it's, it's probably the biggest negative about this activity in some respects. But again, contextually, if you were in bonds, if you're in treasury bills, you're paying full income rates. Um, you know, and, and so it's this interplay of it's better than treasury bills. I'm not saying, obviously, you're taking some risks, but better than treasury bills if you do it right. And no tax disincentive. And it's this discipline aspect that we really like about it. Another page in your playbook. It, yeah. How did you decide how much money to put into this investment? Excess cash that you had lying around, or you thought, hey, what's the probability of this is so great? Let me sell some stuff and put it in this instead. Yeah, fair, we don't. We wouldn't normally sell some things. Um, we're not necessarily inclined to be big leveraged players with our partnership. But what I will say is this: um, we might leverage if that leverage is offset by. Uh, arbitrage, event-driven investments, because they're rolling over quickly. So you've got a reasonable certainty that you can pay that back pretty quickly. Um, it, it, you know what? It's a great question you're asking. I wish I had some, oh, yeah, we think about the weighting this way, you know, high risk, medium risk, low risk. I mean, it tends to be more art form than that. Certainly, do we have any cash around? That's the first, um, the first cut at it. Um, and then past that, so, you know, you, you just, some, some deals are lower risk, some are higher risk. Um, you know, this one, no financing condition, had been well shopped. Johnson & Johnson knows what they're doing. You know, sometimes if you've got a company that's not, um, hasn't had a lot of experience making acquisitions, you'll find, boy, that really drags the time out because, oh, we didn't know we had to do that filing and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, Johnson & Johnson's a machine. They, this is not their first rodeo. They know how to do this. And so that's also part of, you know, trying to assess that risk. Uh, cases where, what if the deal did not go through? Like, do you do this for companies which you say, even that goes through, I'm still happy to hold the share. Yeah, so I mean, for sure, you're looking at a black eye. 
So you have to have a high batting average, or at least initially you're looking at a black eye. It, and that's part of what we, we try to think about. Okay, if something goes wrong, would we be prepared to double down at that point? And, and you know, I joked with, with some of our limited partners a couple months ago, I'm not sure whether to call that a long-term investment at that point or a salvage operation of a, <laughs> of a, of a bad uh, event-driven investment that went bad. Um, okay, I, I, I accept the fuzziness a little bit, but if it's an okay company, you know, that, that is at least at a reasonable valuation. Our, our style is then to double down, and it's amazing how much you can even get it back oftentimes to break even. And in this particular case, although it would have been painful because it was a large premium, we were somewhat comforted that, you know, there were lots of people kicking the tires and Johnson & Johnson just offered the most. So I mean, this is hypothetical, obviously, so the shares dropped to, uh, 190 or 200, you're down, you know, 80, 90 bucks. If you double down at that point, I'm pretty certain one of the other bidders would likely be back at, you know, 225. Again, just hypothetically speaking, you know, at 225 or 230 or 240. So now you're looking at probably not a lot of loss or maybe even break even, but, you know, I think you can, that's one of the advantages that we do have relative to some arbitrage funds that are very highly leveraged at all points in time. They really have no choice but to bail when a deal breaks. So, um, so anyways, that's, you know, actual returns. Let's now talk the one, oh yes. I was just gonna, uh, so here you're long the spread. Well, if you, if you look at the deal and you say it's a, it's a poor quality buyer, maybe it's a Chinese deal or something like that, there's some kind of regulatory risk. Will you guys be short the deal or just kind of this is the only kind of We tend not to do that. Um, um, like I've never done it, but you just when you see these, like we were talking about Acon earlier, and you see these deals break, and it's like, oh, that would be juicy to be short that deal. Like, well, so so full. You know what? It's interesting. You full full confessional here. We were long that deal, and and it breaks. And so what what did we do? The day after it broke, it's down fifteen percent. We doubled down at that price, not our average price, but at that price we're buying. You're buying a stock at thirteen times earnings with a three point four percent dividend yield and a record backlog. Okay, you know. That's not horrible. Okay, too early, I'm not, you know, running up the, putting the bunting up yet and calling it a success, but you know, now we're back, I don't know where it closed today, but now we're back to 15 and a half and we're only 8% underwater on the position and capturing dividends. Um, and in that particular case, in the documents, there was an underbidder to the Chinese. Okay, they don't disclose what price the underbidder uh, had tabled, so my hypothetical or speculation was probably at least $19. Okay, the company has said, all right, we're not for sale anymore, we're gonna run the business. And, and I'm not saying they're being disingenuous by saying that, you know, there's deal fatigue, they had pursued this for so long. But, you know, at some point, it's not inconceivable that whoever that underbidder was, which was not a Chinese company, it was a Canadian company, might come back. You know, don't get me started on how a construction company can represent a security risk. By the way, this company bought a construction firm in Australia. Employment's now doubled to where it was. They bought a company in the United States of America in Houston, employment's up 40% from where it was. You know, the ability to bid on bigger projects. I actually thought it was a net benefit to Canada. Um, okay, the security concerns, um, you know, I kind of think there was a lot of politics at work in this one. But whether it was or it wasn't, you know, let's take it at face value. Yeah, it, it's, we shouldn't be selling this company to the Chinese. It's creating problems. Um, you know, we doubled down. We're about 8% underwater today um, with a company that's paying us, you know, over a 3% dividend while we wait. And I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's a horrible company. Um, and like I say, as I said earlier, I'm probably guilty of some fuzziness on this. Do we now have a long-term investment or are we salvaging a bad, <laughs> a bad arbitrage? You know, 
I plead ignorance as to which one that is. But, you know, that's been our style and it's worked out for us. Um, so certainly part of what we think about is what would it drop to if the deal cratered? At that point, if you doubled down, what would you, you know, what, what, what are you buying? Like, what are the fundamentals at that point? And then again, you know, more often than not, buried in these documents, you know, if you saw there was, and this was not the case with Acon, but if you saw, gee, there were five bidders and this auction went on and on and on and they were the top bidder, I would suggest, you know, Within six months, you get another bid going um, with one of, with a buyer that is more acceptable to the government of Canada. So, so right or wrong, um, so quite the opposite. I mean, we tend not to. Well, I didn't see it coming. I, I will yeah, I admit that. that. Either, I, I mean, I'll admit that. I just thought, how can a company that builds roads and bridges? be a national security risk. Like I know there was talk about nuclear. Well, it's not their nuclear designs. They're just building the plants for the other people. And so I, I thought, um, you know, I don't want to degrade into political <laughs> debate discourse, but I just thought that was um, somewhat weird. And, uh, um, you know, I thought it was interesting, you know, you had two one former liberal uh, foreign trade minister actually wrote an op-ed piece in favor of the deal. Uh, you had a conservative uh, uh, foreign trade, former foreign trade minister wrote an op-ed piece in favor of the deal. And so, you know, it is what it is, but I guess I would just say, you know, we try, not exclusively so, and it depends on your risk profile, um, but if, if you have that ability to average down, you'd be surprised how, so even today, so here we are, what is it, two months after the deal, let's say we decide to sell today. Well, we're looking at an 8% loss only and actually be a little less than that because we've captured a couple dividends. I mean, price loss of 8%, well, you know, I'm not, you can't run around losing money uh, on, on all your investments. That's not a good thing, but I, I'm just saying that's not horrible either in the context of a whole, whole portfolio. So, so let's take you through very quickly one that's in progress today. Um, just happens to be another pharmaceutical. I, I, we don't necessarily have concentrate on pharmaceuticals, but Shire, an Ital uh, Italian, an Irish, drug company is being taken over by, uh, and I, I'm never sure if it's Takeda or Takeda, I'm going to say Takeda, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, by Takeda Pharmaceuticals, the largest pharmaceutical company in Japan and one of the largest companies uh, of any sort in Japan. So what are the basic transaction details? Definitive agreement was announced between the two companies on May 8th. Um, you were going to get, or, or, the comp, or the consideration is $30.33 per Shire share in cash, and either 0.839 of a new Takeda share or 1.678 uh, uh, Takeda American Depository shares. As you'll see in a moment, our math, we're using the Shire American Depository shares which are a multiplier of three. That's what we bought as opposed to the uh, common in Ireland, and we just found it an, an easier way to execute. But I'll get to that in a minute. Um, dividends to be paid until closing. Um, you'll see in our math, we just used the, the last year. They actually are allowed to increase dividends, but we to be conservative, we just said, what if they pay the same as last year? Requires shareholder approval by both companies. Expected closing date, uh, late Q2 of, of 2019. So this is a bit longer deal. It's going to take perhaps a year. Um, I actually think there might be some scope to get it done faster, but based on what the companies are saying, we're using a date of 6 19 So what are the things you need to think about? It's going to create the world's ninth largest pharmaceutical company. So again, think of the regulatory, anti-competitive, overlap, that sort of thing. It's something you want to think about. Um, approximately 50% of the com combined revenues on a pro forma basis will be from the United States. But the good news, there's minimal product overlap. They have different 
portfolios um, of, of, of pharmaceuticals. Um, I just put this in, there's a lot of talk in the press that um, Takeda shareholders are upset about the leverage that Takeda is going to have to take on to do this deal. And there's been some very vocal group involving some of the uh, dispersed family members. I would just caution you, they own less than 1% of the shares. So I personally do not see that as a, as a big problem. But, but certainly Takeda shares are down, and so that's, people are angry when you've got a share consideration, the share price is down. Um, and so when we get shares, we'll often like to be long, shire, and short the compensation that we're gonna receive. We're not at this point, I don't rule out that we might at some point in the future, but hedging those Takeda American Depository shares is difficult, it's just a hard borrow. Um, and it's hard to get the shares borrowed. So we have probably, to be fair, a, a little bit extra risk on this because we haven't locked in the spread. So don't have you know the extensive timeline, obviously, that the other one did because it's to be it's on the come here. But the transaction was announced in May. Um, this is a big one. So Hart Scott uh, anti-competitive uh, approval in the United States was received on July 9th. Remember, 50% of the combined revenues are gonna be in the United States, so if you were gonna have a competitive problem, it would probably emerge there. They actually granted that pretty quickly relative to most deals. So we're maybe thinking, gee, this might advance um, uh, uh, faster than that Q2 2019. So in the initial documents, they're targeting late 2018 for the two shareholder meetings, and they have to have the documents out usually like 45 days in advance of the meeting, and they've that's the timeline both companies have committed to. And then, you know, we had that 624 of 19 estimated closing. So let's walk through, uh, in this case, Why is that not advancing? There we go, we'll try that. There we go, okay. Um, so what do we expect to make if this goes through? Remember I said 30, 30, 33 per Shire share in cash, but we have purchased the American depository shares of Shire, so the multiplier's three all the way through because each American depository share represents three Shire shares, so 30, 33 times three, 90, 99. Um, the ADS consideration, on the day we bought, the Takeda American depository shares were traded at $19.68, the multiplier is 1.678, and then times three again, so that's 99, 07, we've just taken one year of dividends, the most recent year, and extrapolated that forward. Um, price, was, so that package adds up to $191.11, again, using that 1968. I don't know where Takeda closed today, but you know, yesterday it was trading at 20, 2080 or something like that, so, um, you know, it's actually a little more than that now. Um, we paid 160.91, so our gross profit in theory would be $30.20. That's an 18.77% spread over 377 days, because um, we're targeting June of next year and we were buying in May, so a little over a year, 377 days, it would be an 18. 0.1% annualized rate of return. I'm not saying that's what it will be, but that's what our thought process is saying. The biggest risk we've got, um, separate from the deal itself, is this fact that we haven't hedged out the ADSs, and we may try to do that or even do it in part if we can't borrow at all. Maybe we can borrow a little bit. Um, yes? Uh, Shire we bought an offer in 2014 um, from Adley? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it is the same issues in Japan 
bring or pharmaceutical is trying to move to like a, a low tax jurisdiction? Like it's no, tax no. In actual fact, the tax piece is off the table. Um, they expect to pay full Japanese tax rate. Now, you know, there'll be an Irish component, right, that's at a lower tax rate, but this is not, they're not yeah, yeah, they're not moving the headquarters um, from Japan to to Ireland, so you don't have those issues. Um, and that's, so that's actually something that lowers the risk, in my opinion, um, all things being equal. So again, I'm not saying that's what the return will be, but that's how we're thinking about it. It may be higher, it may be lower, um, who knows? Um, but that's, um, so let me just wrap this up here. What's kind of the summary? What's the key takeaways that I would want to leave you with from an investment perspective? Um, what we like about it, returns depend on transaction complete completion and not on movements in equity markets. So it gives you that insulation um, effects. Most transactions are uncorrelated with each other. So, you know, whether, imagine if you will, the two examples I gave you were going on at the same time, whether Actelion and Johnson & Johnson succeed, there has nothing to do with whether Takeda Shire, uh, yes? So if you have one transaction blow up and you had a lot of the guys that were in it and they were levered up and so they have to unwind, like did, is it sometimes correlated or is it, is it like I mean I don't know how it works, so is it, is it sometimes that it moves around and it moves other spreads, but it's not it, pretty nice? Sure, I'm not, I mean I'd be crazy, I'm not gonna stand up here and say that you can't have those dynamics, but over a full portfolio of these things. Right, right. And over the whole duration, you know, sometimes maybe that gives you an opportunity. Oh, why, why is the spread on this deal suddenly? Yeah. Let's pause at what you're saying takes place. Arbitrage is getting blown up on Acon, so they're selling their shire, you know, because they gotta they gotta raise some cash. I mean, that may create an opportunity for us too, right? Like, okay, there's no reason why this spread is has opened up, and so you know that may be be more of an opportunity than a problem. I stand by that comment that they're mostly uncorrelated. Of course, I'd be crazy to say they're absolutely 100% um, uncorrelated. Short completion times lead to cash availability. So what, what I mean by that is, you know, all of a sudden markets go down 25%, 30%, and there's all sorts of wonderful opportunities available to put money to work in long-term investments. Well, you're going to be rolling these things over, and so you'll have that opportunity to, to put money to work. Um, Multi-strategy benefits, and to me, I just the way I like to think about it is it gives us another page in our investment playbook, and I don't think that's a bad thing. And you know, the Buffett uh, comments about it. You know, you don't lower your standards if you've got other things that you can do while you're waiting to find those wonderful long-term investments. I think that's an important part of it. Um, good information availability. What I like about this business is it's all in the documents. Read the documents. You can figure it out. Now. Some of them, uh, Brookfield Canadian companies buying GG, the GGP uh, general growth properties that they don't um, already own, they own 34 percent. Uh, the offering documents 785 pages. Now, man, if you can't get it set in 200 pages, I don't know why it takes 785. So it can be time intensive, but if you read the documents, the information's all there, and you can figure it out. How many of these do you see? Like, you pay service at the flag thing for you. How many of these do you, you see, and how do you choose them? Um, so, we work off, you know, there's various services that'll give you a list of all the deals. Um, so then it becomes a little bit art form, you know. Um, what's the spread? I mean, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on one if it has a negative spread. Sometimes they have negative spreads because people are anticipating that another bidder is going to come along. Um, 
you know, I have a woeful track record of failure trying to figure out when you're going to get another another bid. So, you know, we tend not to, we might do something flat, you know, or okay, we're not going to lose money, but, you know, we need another bidder to come along to make money. But so, you know, the negative spread should just rule out. Um, you know, some obscure company you've never heard of is making a bid for IBM. Okay, great, but where are they going to get the money? You know, like, so you, you, you can rule a bunch out pretty quickly. Um, and then, you know, we just, you know, we kind of want to get double digit rates of return so we're not looking at things at, you know, um, three and four percent just because interest rates are two. You know, I, we don't think that's a good risk reward. Um, proposition, but I, I like this because if you do the work, it's not to say you won't get surprised like we did with Acon. We didn't think that it was going to blow, and it did. But you know, all the information's in the documents. And by the way, you know, even in the documents, underbidder. Don't know what the price was, but it was a Canadian company. We know that they disclosed that. You know, I'm saying it's probably 19. So you never know. Um, so let's talk some of what I see as, as the negatives. Um, well, the obvious one, transactions can break for many reasons. And this is not an all-inclusive list, but you know, these are some of the, the, the main ones. You, know, you can't get the financing or the bank pulls the financing. Shareholders reject the deal. Um, regulatory concerns or antitrust approvals um, or a material adverse event happens. Um, any single transaction is a binary event. And all I mean by that is, yeah, the deal happens or it breaks. So a good batting average is required. Um, you, you know, that's just because you're making small rates of return. And when something goes bad, you know, you're, you've got to you're looking at a big loss. So you, you really need to have a good um, batting average to make this work. And then this, to your point earlier, short-term nature of event-driven investing creates tax exposure. And I, I do think that, you know, if you, can, if you were around in 1964 and bought Berkshire Hathaway and you owned it till today, you know, I think there was one dividend uh, one time. Is that right, George? The, yeah, because Buffett jokes that he must have been in the washroom when they declared that dividend. But, you know, you would have had effectively no tax, right? But these, you're rolling them over and you're always exposing yourself to tax. Every jurisdiction's different, so I'm not going to weigh in on, you know, whether that's good or bad. But again, you know, your, your, your comparative is really treasury bills and short bonds. And, you know, so I still don't think... Um, if you don't have long-term investments, that you can really say the tax side is a disincentive. So um, that's it. Um, happy to take uh, any other questions that anybody has.